Okay, I have to admit, anytime I get access to a physics-based game with helium balloons in it, one of the first things I do is see if I can get objects to float on top of a whole bunch of them, like... Ow, how about a cat? Gee, <laughs> that cat was so terrified, it went upside down. Now seriously, that's some crazy black magic right there. Now here's an ancient DOS game I remember watching as a kid, but never really getting a chance to play, entitled The Incredible Machine. Again, this was one of those titles our elementary school had only one copy of instead of a whole site license, meaning only one system was allowed to run the game at any moment. Thus, anyone getting to the computer lab first always got to play this thing, and it was never me. In any case, I find it curious that this game is considered as educational as it was in the past because Quite frankly, it doesn't actually teach anything at all. The physics, while pretty decent for a 90s vintage game, aren't perfect, not to mention a bit ridiculous at times. And even the manual is written more so as just a list of things you can do instead of going in-depth into the basics of making mechanical contraptions of any kind. Well, that doesn't make the game any less fun, though. It masquerades as edutainment by being a puzzle-solving game that utilizes physics and basic mechanical actions. So when it comes to games you could play in the classroom, this is probably the most enjoyable to get to play in that environment, given that it's a legitimate gaming experience with no actual educational components whatsoever. Now, I'm actually playing the sequel called The Even More Incredible Machine, which virtually doubles the number of parts you can mess around with, but it not only works exactly like the original game, but also has all of the puzzles from the original game as well. So it's more like an expanded version of the original game rather than its own separate entity. To that end, I'm not going to be covering the expanded content today, and I'll be focusing on what the game originally came with because, quite frankly, due to the lack of educational components, it actually took a bit of gameplay to get the hang of working with everything here, and I didn't want to give myself too much to handle. The Incredible Machine was originally created by Jeff Tenel Productions in 1992 for Macintosh computers. However, for the DOS port, Dynamics was brought into the mix, and it was published by Sierra Online in 1993. It's a one-player puzzle game which has some uh, curious video and audio support. In terms of video, it only supports a modified VGA16 color mode running at 640x448 resolution. Which, I have no idea what aspect ratio that's supposed to look like, so I just took an educated guess with this video. Though I am guessing that because of the 256k limit for video memory with VGA cards, that they probably went with that resolution in order to allow for double buffering, which isn't normally possible at 640x480. Actually, it's not even possible at 640x448, but the smaller screen space where the action actually happens, it's definitely double buffered from some of the things I've seen. So my guess is that's why they went with such a strange resolution. In terms of audio, it supports a very strange array of audio devices. For starters, it only supports the PC speaker for music, not for sound effects. Well, at least according to the setup program. It supports the Tandy DAC for sound effects, but not for music. It supports a few devices for music alone, as well as a few devices for both music and sound together, including something called the IBM PS1 audio card, which provided the same sound capabilities as the original PC Junior and Tandy 3 voice chipsets. 
yet it doesn't support Tandy 3 voice sound. Yeah, audio support in this thing is just weird. Also, even though AdLib is not supported for sound effects, I'm pretty sure some of the effects being played back with the Sound Blaster support are synthesized, so theoretically, the AdLib should be capable of playing them back. That said, some of the sounds are digitized too, so selecting Sound Blaster with only an AdLib card installed may not be such a good idea. As for its current release date, it's still commercial and can be obtained from the good old games website at www.gog.com for $10. The reason it's a bit pricier than most old DOS releases on GOG is because it comes as a pack with four titles, comprising the content from six releases, including the even more incredible machine, the even more incredible machine contraptions, the return of the incredible machine contraptions, and the incredible machine 3. Suffice to say, you get a ton of puzzles to play with with this purchase. So if you like what you're about to see, then this thing's gonna be like candy to you. As for physical copies, since all the different sequels have such similar names, finding the very first one boxed or even just as a CD is extremely challenging. Most physical releases of the games in the series can be found for dirt cheap online. Save for this very first one, which has become something of a collectible and tends to go for $30 to $40 for just the game alone. Basically, unless you absolutely want a physical copy for sake of collecting, you're better off going for a physical copy of the even more incredible machine, which you can get super cheap, or with the digital pack you can buy from GOG. So the premise of this game is extremely simple. You're basically trying to complete certain objectives for each puzzle, but to reach those objectives requires that you use a crazy assortment of objects which interact in various ways. While that's essentially all there is to it, an understanding of basic mechanical concepts and physics goes a long way towards solving these puzzles. However, there's five particular game mechanics you're going to need to understand very well to solve these puzzles. Impact triggers, belts, ropes, electricity, and wind. Although the manual doesn't call it this, impact triggers are essentially objects in the game which do something when hit by another object in motion with enough force and at an appropriate angle. Objects which are triggered to act when hit include scissors, mice running in wheels, teeter-totters, bellows, boxing gloves, trampolines, flashlights, fishbowls, and dynamite plungers. Belts are used to transfer the spinning motion of one object to another and are necessary for running conveyors and gears, as well as for setting off jack-in-the-boxes and generating electricity with generators. Spinning action can be generated by mice running in wheels, windmills, electric engines, and monkeys riding exercise bikes while being tempted with bananas shown to them through Venetian shutters. Yeah, that's just one big mass of wacky right there. Actually, the monkeys have an impact trigger too and will be stunned when hit on the head and will stop pedaling even when faced with a banana. Ropes are used to attach two objects together, though with the use of pulleys you can convert the directions the rope is applying force in, thus allowing something in motion in one direction to affect change in another, which is necessary for pulling down those monkey blinds or pulling back the triggers on guns. Unlike the belts, which have a range limit, Ropes have an unlimited range, but once connected to two objects, the size of the rope will be fixed to the length it now is, unless the connected objects are moved or the rope is removed. Ropes can also be cut by scissors when testing out your build. Electricity can be generated in one of three ways, either by flicking a switch up or down depending on its initial orientation, using a belt-driven generator, or through a solar panel powered by a light source such as a light bulb or flashlight. You can plug up to two electrical devices into the outlet for an electricity generating object simply by placing the electrical device very close by. Devices powered by electricity simply include electric fans and electric engines. The last major mechanic is wind, as you generate wind through the use of bellows, windmills, or electric fans. Wind can be used to push many different kinds of objects without actually having to connect that object to anything, and is a mechanic which is used more so in the earlier puzzles than the later puzzles. Now beyond these major mechanics, there's other lesser mechanics which come into play too. For instance, there's a variety of different kinds of balls, each with different properties. Basketballs and tennis balls are light and bouncy, with the tennis balls being smaller. Bowling balls and baseballs are the non-bouncy equivalents of those. While cannonballs are sort of a special in-between which can be placed manually, 
but are often encountered by firing them out of cannons. Different balls are going to be better used in different situations, but when all is said and done, the main purpose of a ball in this game is to hit something to create an effect. Although many puzzles often require you to sort or group balls in some sort of way. You also need to take advantage of lighting things on fire, but oddly, there's no direct way to do this. You light things aflame, either candles, dynamite, cannons, or rockets, by using a combination of a magnifying glass and a light source. There's no other way to do it. Though once lit, candles gain the ability to light other things aflame or pop balloons. <laughs> Speaking of the balloons, they're everywhere in this game. Which, quite frankly, doesn't surprise me, as they're used to great versatility given their anti-gravity nature. You... most of the time. The reason that happened is that each puzzle actually has gravity and pressure settings, which adjust how gravity works and how air pressure works. And air pressure effectively adjusts how the balloons act, as well as how wind forces work on other objects. The balloons in this game can be used to hoist things connected to ropes, they can be used to push against switches or trigger impacts from underneath, and they also don't survive interactions with scissors, candles, spinning gears, guns, or basically anything sharp and pointy. Given the number of videos online of people finding creative ways to both use and or burst balloons, their prevalence here doesn't surprise me. Buckets also have a special interaction in that things can fall into them, thus adjusting how much they weigh. This comes into play in a few puzzles, as if you have two buckets tied together with a rope with equal amounts of weight in each, neither will move. Yet if one outweighs the other, it'll drop while the other is lifted. The cats, mice, and fish bowls also have curious interactions. Cats in this game are attracted to mice from any distance so long as they're level with each other, while cats are also attracted to fish bowls, but only at short range. A fishbowl can only attract a cat from a distance if it's broken. Mice run away from cats because if a cat catches one, it gets eaten. Otherwise, mice are content to just stay completely still. Most of these interactions are actually completely pointless for most of the machine designs here, though cats and mice which fall off of ledges can create impacts just like balls, balloons, and buckets. Rockets and cages are the only two object types left to really talk about, but there's not much to say. Cages are like inverted buckets, able to keep things from escaping if dropped on top, and serve little purpose other than to clear an objective. Rockets, once lit, will blast off and potentially set things ablaze behind them, but they ultimately do the same thing a balloon would, and it's extremely difficult to get a good idea of how a rocket's going to interact with your creation, as sometimes a single pixel of alignment can make a massive difference to the outcome. And it's actually one of the game's strongest assets, but also one of its worst weaknesses, is that single pixels can actually make a huge difference in the outcomes. And take this puzzle here for example, where I have to get all four mice running at the same time. I came up with a solution to getting the left tennis ball into the left opening, but despite replicating this exact setup on the right side, the ball doesn't go in. This is because the ball on the right is actually not in the same relative position and is actually offset by a couple pixels, meaning the result is different. This is something you're going to find with a lot of puzzles, that oftentimes there's no obvious answer as it's all about letting the physics do their thing and seeing what happens. You'll find yourself running some puzzles without any modifications just to see what the result would be. Other times the answers may be too obvious as certain items are needed to achieve certain results, thus just fill in the gaps. However, while that sounds mostly like a weakness, the reason it's also a strength is because this can often lead to multiple solutions to each puzzle. And this one right here is a great example. The platforms and the gap between, plus having the perfect amount of dynamite and a rocket to set them all off, makes it seem like the solution should be a no-brainer. But I had trouble making that approach work. So instead, I went for the pixel-perfect physics approach and came up with this solution without using any of the dynamite or even the rocket. Essentially, if it works, it's legit, and it doesn't matter how many parts you have left at the side. In fact, the manual for the game encourages you to add dummy objects when creating your own puzzles to fool unsuspecting players, or give them alternative means of solving your puzzles. Yeah, if you get bored of the 80-something puzzles on display here, you can just make your own. The process of making a puzzle is mostly trial and error, but functions very much like making any sort of puzzle for any sort of puzzle game. 
you start with the solution, then work your way backwards to a point that the solution can be derived from. At first I thought this was mostly just a sandbox, but I ultimately figured out that it has almost all of the workings necessary to do full-blown puzzles. All it's missing is a way of detecting the end goal. So you simply write in what the goal is and allow players to decide if they achieve the goal or not. Once you have your puzzle fully designed, the simplest way to set up the objects which can be placed is to exit out of the creator, go to the objects panel from the puzzle select screen, remove every part in the list, then go back into the puzzle editor and simply remove any parts you don't want placed by default into the toolbox on the side. You can then toggle a lock on every other part that you've used to prevent them from being unintentionally moved. Well, it is actually one thing which took me a while to get used to is that the right mouse button is used to cancel out back to the puzzle selection screen. Whereas I'm used to the right mouse button and stuff like this acting as a sort of mistake correcting button. It took me most of my gameplay footage, but I eventually got used to this and would drag items back to the toolbox instead of trying to right click them into non existence and going back to the puzzle select screen. Overall, The Incredible Machine is not edutainment. It's a physics based puzzle game, albeit a very good one with a lot of creativity, made long before physics engines were all the rage. It's not the first game of its kind, but it's definitely the most recognizable and very approachable, provided you have the manual. While this is a game kids would enjoy for sure, attempting to play this game without the manual would involve a surprisingly steep learning curve and may frustrate younger children, particularly because the game doesn't really explain how anything works. So if you are going to introduce kids to this game, make sure you understand it yourself first so you can help them out with the trickier aspects. Beyond that, this is a game which should appeal to just about anyone with a creative side to themselves, although it'll be the tinkering type of person or puzzle game aficionados who will ultimately stick with it through every puzzle it has to offer. And despite being a 90s game, the timing in this thing is terrible, so you need to set a fixed cycles count to get it to run at an even remotely normal speed. The GOG release sets cycles to 8000, but I've found that that's not enough. Instead, I recommend a cycles count of 12,500, and that should be all you need to set to get this thing up and running. Anywho, that's all for episode 185 of Ancient DOS Games. Next week's a filler, and while I'm open to suggestions, I've been thinking about taking a look back at some of my own older game projects, you know, just for fun. Still, if you guys have any other ideas, be sure to send them in to adg at pixelships.com, and don't forget too that this is a month with five Saturdays, so there won't be any videos for the last two, as I only do ADG uploads on the first three Saturdays of every month. Guys, I hope you all stay tuned as there's plenty more stuff to check out in the coming weeks and only 15 more regular episodes to go until we reach 200. Columbus, in command, I need to go around and check on something. We're currently at the edge of the solar system. We came under fire by a rather curious individual. Claims he panicked and accidentally. They gave us some galactic coordinates. Let's see if there's anything in this case that's modeled about this place. I know that they are archaic. I think we're going to need all the... I don't know if we can trust these creatures. Eagle out.